Hi, Bookish Besties. My name is Brittany. This is Rescues and Reads. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you are new, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And if you are already subscribed, as always, I appreciate your continued support. Thank you for returning to another video. Today, it is once again time to do my book of the month predictions, this time for the month of July. All right, everyone, it is now time for one of my favorite videos to film every single month, and that is my book of the month prediction video. So today we are going to talk about the books that I think have a high probability of being featured either as part of their monthly curated selections or as part of their add-on selections. As a quick reminder, at the beginning of these videos, I'm no longer wrapping up how I did with the previous month's predictions. Instead, I'm doing a separate video at the beginning of the month. So after the selections are made for July, I will come on here and do a pick or pass video. Now, as per usual, my predictions have been broken up into to five distinctive genre categories and I limit myself to five predictions per category just to make it a little bit more challenging. Again, I'm only focusing on book releases that are actually coming out in July. With that being said, I did want to quickly mention that Book of the Month has recently put two new add-ons on their website. Of course, we do see Riley Sager's newest release called Middle of the Night. As I mentioned in my previous prediction video, even though his book is coming out in June, typically they feature him as like a mid-month add-on selection or as a July selection, so I was not necessarily sure to see that he was not part of the main curated selections or add-ons for the month of June, but he is now there so you can add him to your July box. Or if you did wait to make your selections, he is now there to add into your box for the month of June. Another mid-month add-on selection was Same As It Ever Was by Claire Lombardo. This, if I remember correctly, is kind of like a family drama. So both of them are now on there free to add to your box for the month of July. So taking a look at all of the predictions that I have for this month, I feel like it's a little light to be honest with you. Most of the categories with the exception of I think of the mystery thriller horror category don't go up to five selections. I don't know, there was really just nothing standing out about the releases in July that I felt could be featured on Book of the Month. So I have a feeling that a lot of the selections for Book of the Month in July are going to be a surprise to me, but we are going to see. And speaking of the mystery thriller horror category, we are going to go ahead and start with that as per usual. And my very first prediction is actually the newest release from Katherine Stedman called Look in the Mirror. Book of the Month previously featured Katherine Stedman with The Family Game, and I actually really had a great time with that one. I had never read a Katherine Stedman before, and I would be absolutely willing to read more from Katherine Stedman in the future. Now, as per usual, I'm going to go ahead and go through and read either brief blurbs or the synopses of these stories. I know a lot of people don't necessarily like when booktubers do that. However, as I have not read any of these and I'm not intimately familiar with their content, I feel like it's a little bit easier and more cohesive for me to do this for you. I know that you all are perfectly capable of going on and googling the synopses yourself, but this is just a one-stop place for you to get all of the information on these books to make a decision on whether or not you could be interested in adding them to your book of the month box. So that is why I do this. So I hope that it's okay with you. But this says, still grieving her father's death, Nina learns she has inherited property in the British Virgin Islands, a vacation home she had no idea existed until now. The house is extraordinary, state-of-the-art, all glass and marble. How did her sensible father come into enough money for this? Why did he keep it from her? And what else was he hiding? Once an ambitious medical student, Maria is a nanny for the super rich. The money's better and so are the destinations where her work takes her. Just one more gig and she'll be set. But when her wards never show, Maria begins to make herself at home, spending her days luxuriating by the pool. There's just one rule. Don't go in the basement. But her curiosity just might get the better of her and soon she'll wish her only worry was not getting paid. So right off the bat, I'm a little interested to see how those two perspectives intersect. Like I said, I really enjoyed The Family Game by Katherine Stedman. I'm willing to trust her on this one and if it is a book of the month selection, I will absolutely be adding it to my box. This next prediction is a debut thriller and it's giving me a little bit of vibes of the writing retreat. It's called The Astrology House by Karen Jade. It says, Margot needs a minute. She's been working 80 hour weeks as a newly minted partner at her law firm. She's disconnected from her brother, the only family she has left, and she's still not pregnant after years of trying. Stars Harbor Astrological Retreat promises rest, relaxation, and wisdom for Margot and her friends. With Instagram-worthy views and nightly astrology readings in an impeccably restored waterfront Victorian house, this getaway should be nothing but idyllic fun. For Margot's brother, Adam, it's the perfect opportunity to rekindle the romance that fuels his writing. But his wife, Amy, hides the darkness of her past with a beautiful social media feed. Their friend, Farah, is a successful doctor who cannot admit she's losing control. But no one holds a greater secret than their astrologer host, Rini. She has a plan for all her guests and one won't be leaving Stars Harbor alive. So like I said, I was really enjoying the vibe of this. I don't necessarily know if this is going to be an isolationist thriller, but it does sound like they are going to kind of be on their own at this retreat. It sounds like there could potentially be rich people behaving badly. I'm not sure, but the holder of this retreat is definitely up to something. And like I said, I am getting the writing retreat vibes. So this was one that really piqued my interest and I would love to see it on Book of the Month. This next one is probably the one that I'm most hoping is 
is going to be featured on Book of the Month because it is the newest release by Liz Moore called The God of the Woods. Liz Moore was previously featured on Book of the Month with Long Bright River, which I really, really enjoyed. I think I read that one in like 24 hours. I had a great time with it. It was definitely very gritty and that is something that I typically do look for in my thrillers. So I was really captivated and engaged with that and I would love to see what else she can do with a different story. This says early morning, August 1975. So there's a historical aspect here. A camp counselor discovers an empty bunk. Its occupant, Barbara Van Lahr, has gone missing. Barbara isn't just any 13 year old. She's the daughter of the family that owns the summer camp and employs most of the region's residents. And this isn't the first time a Van Lahr child has disappeared. Barbara's older brother similarly banished 14 years ago, never to be found. As a panic search begins, a thrilling drama unfolds, chasing down the layered secrets of the Van Lahr family and the blue collar community working in its shadow. Moore's multi-threaded story invites readers into a rich and gripping dynasty of secrets and second chances. It is Liz Moore's most ambitious and wide reaching novel yet. And I'm absolutely here for it. We're definitely going to get some atmospheric vibes, the summer camp vibe. We have a missing child. We have a family with secrets. So there's going to be those like complex family dynamics that I absolutely live for. And like I said, it definitely sounds like there's going to be a darkness to this as well. Maybe even a gritty aspect that was featured in her previous book. And I'm really intrigued by this. I absolutely do hope that it is featured on Book of the Month. And then this final prediction is one that is set in a tropical location. And I'm not sure what it is about Book of the Month and their tropical locations, but they love to feature thrillers that are set on tropical islands, tropical destinations, things like that. They are consistently featuring books set in this type of location. So this is absolutely one that I think is a strong possibility of being featured on Book of the Month for the month of July. It says, best friends Darcy, Camilla, and Kate escape for a post-divorce retreat in the Maldives. Perfect place to relax, reset, and embrace a fresh start in life. Darcy is learning how to be a free woman at 42. Camilla has found the perfect calling as a fitness and wellness influencer with a devoted following. And Kate is finally working on the book she was meant to write after years of telling other people's stories. Their dream getaway, the exclusive and isolated Sapphire Island Resort. Okay, there we go. We have isolated, a big buzzword, with luxurious private villas, crystal clear waters, and sun-drenched white sand beaches. Relaxation is guaranteed. But this is no ordinary friendship, and they're not the only guests on the island with secrets. Who left the body on the beach? And who's next? A propulsive and deliciously dark tale about female friendship, loyalty, and lies. Bad Tourists is a white-hot thriller from the first word to its mind-blowing finish. I am absolutely intrigued by that. I will say that tropical isolation thrillers don't necessarily work for me like wintry isolation thrillers. I'd be willing to give this a try, although I do admit to being a little bit hesitant about the female friendship aspect. I hope it's not going into a toxic female friendship aspect. We all know that I really hate toxic female friendship, mean girls, all of that stuff. Like I said, this one is definitely on my radar and if it's featured on Book of the Month, I will snag it. All right, moving on into the romance category. There actually seemed like there were going to be quite a few cute romances coming out in the month of July, but in all honesty, not a lot of them really caught my attention in terms of their potential to be featured on Book of the Month. I do have two here, however, that I want to talk about. One is purely because she would be a repeat author and that is Rainbow Rowell. She actually has a new adult contemporary coming out called Slow Dance. I don't know if Book of the Month would ever feature her again, but I did feel like I had to mention it here. It says, back in high school, everybody thought Shiloh and Carrie would end up together. Everybody but Shiloh and Carrie. They were just friends, best friends, allies. They spent entire summers sitting on Shiloh's porch steps, dreaming about the future. They were both going to get out of North Omaha. Shiloh would go to college and become an actress and Carrie would join the Navy. They promised each other that their friendship would never change. Well, Shiloh did go to college and Carrie did join the Navy and yet somehow everything changed. Now Shiloh's 33 and it's been 14 years since she talked to Carrie. She's been married and divorced. She has two kids and she's back living in the same house she grew up in. Her life is nothing like she planned. When she's invited to an old friend's wedding, all Shiloh can think about is whether Carrie will be there and whether she hopes he will be. Would Carrie even want to talk to her after everything? Slow Dance is the story of two kids who fell in love before they knew enough about love to recognize it. Two friends who lost everything. Two adults who just feel lost. It's the story of Shiloh and Carrie who everyone thought would end up together trying to find their way back to the start. I am actually really digging the synopsis of that one. I love a good second chance romance. I honestly do. Especially when we're dealing with older main characters who have seen a lot of life and who now have baggage coming back to each other. I'm not necessarily sure how I feel about Rainbow Rowell in general. I know that I really enjoyed Fangirl back when I was reading young adult fiction. I really enjoyed that one. I absolutely detested Landline and I thought Attachments was just okay. But I'm wondering how Rainbow Rowell has progressed as an author since her last release, which I believe has been a while ago now, not including like the Carry On series. But I believe it's been a while since she's written an adult contemporary. This sounds really like the character driven kind of story, kind of romance that I really enjoy. Harder hitting aspects to it as well that I think could work for me. We all know how very selective I am about romance. So this could definitely be one that I'd be willing to give a try. Early reviews are good. It's got a 4.11 right now at 735 ratings. So I don't know. This would be one that I could be convinced to add to my box for Book of the Month. And the final prediction that I have for the romance category is one that I just really enjoyed the sound of. And it was giving me kind of similar vibes to One to Watch, which was a previous Book of the Month selection, which I really, really enjoyed. This is called The Villain Edit by 
by Lori DeVore. It says, good villains make good TV. Romance novelist Jacqueline Mathis' big career has gone bust and she's ditched the bright lights of New York City for her more affordable South Carolina hometown. Desperate, Jack dreams up a comeback plan. She is going to be a contestant on The One, the most obsessively watched reality dating show in the world. On set, Jack quickly establishes herself as a front runner for Bachelor Marcus's heart, but she's shocked to discover who's actually pulling the strings. How was she to know that Henry Foster, her last one night stand before the show, was actually a longtime producer on The One? Henry is just as horrified, but they can't seem to keep their hands off each other. As Jack plays the game and the show unfurls, she slowly discovers that she's getting the villain edit. They say there's no such thing as bad publicity, but as Jack's secret plan begins crumbling around her, she's not so sure. What happens if Marcus chooses her? Worse, what happens if her affair with Henry comes to light? What if, in trying to save her career, Jack has ruined her life? All right, so that's definitely very different from the one to watch. Now that I've read through all of the synopsis of it, I'm not entirely sure. I love the idea of this person having a relationship with somebody when she's supposed to be vying for the heart of the bachelor. I don't necessarily know if this is one I would pick up, but I am intrigued enough by the synopsis of this one to think that it could be on Book of the Month's radar. So we're going to see, but I did want to feature it here. All right, moving on into the contemporary slash literary fiction category. I actually only have three for this category this time. So yeah, it was kind of a light month for me in terms of predictions. But the first one I have is a book called Pink Glass Houses by Asha Elias. And this definitely sounds like it's going to have an aspect of rich people behaving badly. There's a reason people call Miami Beach a sunny place for shady people. Welcome to Sunset Academy, the most coveted elementary school in Miami Beach, where there are three categories of families, rich, wealthy, and ultra wealthy. Perfectly tanned and smiling, Charlotte Giordani is Sunset Academy's alpha mom. With a sleek blowout and relentless charm, Charlotte's brashness serves her well. She's up for election as the PTA president and is riding high, having just secured a massive donation from billionaire Don Walker and his socialite wife, Patricia. Don and Patricia are philanthropists, media darlings, and the owners of Villa Rose, a newly built modern glass house that everyone is talking about. Enter Melody Howard, a wide-eyed transplant from Wichita, Kansas. At first, a skeptic about Miami Beach and its endlessly hashtagable social scene, Melody finds herself sucked into the glossy, frenetic world of Sunset Academy moms. Melody's easygoing manner and background in nonprofit management make her an asset to the PTA, but when she emerges as a rival for the PTA presidency, Charlotte begins to unravel. Even the most powerful players on the social scene prove to be vulnerable when an investigation into white-collar crime triggered by another school mom, the formidable Jamaican-American Judge Carol Lawson, threatens to take down the whole institution. No amount of rosé can soothe tensions as the drama builds to a shocking crisis point. Told in rotating first-person voices, Pink Glass Houses is an irresistibly voyeuristic peek into the lives of the rich and famous, where cocaine playdates, $100,000 kitty birthday parties, and relentless social climbing are a way of life. Yes, so definitely rich people behaving badly. I know a lot of people are really into those storylines. This is definitely more on the contemporary slash maybe like Big Little Lies aspect. It is a little bit intriguing to me, but I'm not sure if I'm that interested in wealthy people and their shenanigans enough to pick this up. But this was one of the more notable contemporary fictions that was coming out, so I had to mention it here. This next one is actually a repeat author. It is the newest release by Ethan Joella called The Same Bright Stars. He actually wrote the book called A Quiet Life, which I did pick up from Book of the Month, but I haven't read it yet. It's actually one that's been lingering on my TBR that I've kind of been considering on hauling. I'm not sure because it does seem right up my alley, but it is there. It's on my TBR card. I'm definitely going to give it a shot. I haven't made up my mind about this one though. This says, three generations of Schmitz have run their family's beachfront restaurant and Jack has been at the helm since his father's death. He puts the demands of the restaurant above all else with a string of failed relationships, no hobbies and no days off as proof of his commitment to the place. He can't remember the last time he sat on the beach or enjoyed a moment to himself. Meanwhile, the Del Dine group has been snapping up beloved eateries along the stretch of coast and it is pursuing Jack with a very generous offer to take Schmitz off his hands. Jack craves companionship and maybe even a family. He wonders whether closing the door on the restaurant might open a window for him, but who would he be without Schmitz? And can he trust Del Dine's claims that it will continue to employ his staff and honor his family's legacy? So again, this definitely sounds like it's going to be a character driven, more contemporary slash literary fiction that really deals with some harder topics. You have a man who has been running his family's restaurant for a long time. He's considering letting it go, but what would that mean for his identity? It definitely sounds like it could be an interesting story. I'm not necessarily sure if I'm going to be picking this up, but because he is a repeat author, I do think he has a strong possibility of being featured. And then this last one is actually coming out at the very end of July. So it has as much likelihood of being featured in July as it does in August, but it's a book called Off the Books by Soma May Shang Frazier. It says, recent Dartmouth dropout May, in search of a new direction in life, drives a limo to make ends meet. Her grandfather convinces her to allow her customers to pay under the table, and before she knows it, she is working as a routine chauffeur for sex workers. May does her best to mind her own business, but her knack for discretion soon leads her on a life-changing trip from San Francisco to Syracuse with a new client. Handsome and reserved, Henry piques May's interest, toting an enormous black suitcase with him everywhere he goes. He's more concerned with taking frequent breaks than making good time on the road. When May discovers Henry's secret, she does away with her usual close-lipped demeanor and decides she has no choice but to confront him. What Henry reveals rocks her to her core and shifts this once casual transactional road 
road trip to one of moral stakes and dangerous consequences. An original take on the Great American Road Trip off the books is beautifully crafted coming of age story that showcases the resilience of the human spirit and the power of doing the right thing. The spirit of Frazier's characters will stay with readers long after they have arrived at their destination. So this is just one that recently came on my radar. It definitely sounds like a unique concept, one that I've never really seen portrayed in books. Sure, there's definitely road trip books out there, but the actual reason for the road trip and all of that stuff definitely sounds more unique in nature. I'm not entirely sure how confident I am that this would be featured, but again, this is one that I've seen kind of going around, and so I wanted to mention it here. All right, and then moving on into the historical fiction category, I actually only have one book in this category today. It is called A Thousand Times Before by Asha Tonki. This synopsis is pretty long, but it says a heartrending family saga following three generations of women connected by a fantastic tapestry through which they inherit the experiences of those that lived before them, sweeping readers from partition era India to modern day Brooklyn. Sweeping, deeply felt, and intergenerational, A Thousand Times Before is a debut as poetic as it is propulsive, as healing as it is heartbreaking, as it examines what it means to carry our past with us and pass it on. Rooted in a tender love story and spun with a tremendous amount of care, this book is a rare, remarkable feat from an incredible new literary talent. So there are a lot of buzzwords in there. First, we have multi-generational, intergenerational. We definitely have a debut author situation here. We have a book that's at least partially set in India. Book of the Month definitely loves these sweeping, multi-generational family stories that are at least partially set in other countries. So this is another one that is a strong contender for July for Book of the Month. All right, now moving on into the final category, which is fantasy, sci-fi, and magical realism. We actually have a new release by Meg Schaefer called The Lost Story. Now Meg Schaefer wrote The Wishing Game, which was a really popular release for Book of the Month last year. I actually just recently read that story and really enjoyed it. I had a good time with it, so I might actually pick up a copy from Book of the Month. And this one says that it's actually inspired by the Chronicles of Narnia. As boys, best friends Jeremy Cox and Rafe Howell went missing in a vast West Virginia state forest, only to mysteriously reappear six months later with no explanation for where they'd gone or how they'd survived. 15 years after their miraculous homecoming, Rafe is a reclusive artist who still bears scars inside and out, but has no memory of what happened during those months. Meanwhile, Jeremy has become a famed missing persons investigator. With his uncanny abilities, he is the one person who can help vet tech Emily Wendell find her sister, who vanished in the very same forest as Rafe and Jeremy. Jeremy alone knows the fantastical truth about the disappearances, for while the rest of the world was searching for them, the two missing boys were in a magical realm filled with impossible beauty and terrible danger. He believes it is where they will find Emily's sister. However, Jeremy has kept Rafe in the dark since their return for his own inscrutable reasons. But the time for burying secrets comes to an end as the quest for Emily's sister begins. The former lost boys must confront their shared past, no matter how traumatic the memories. All right, everybody, I'm so sorry for any kind of abrupt shift in angle or anything like that. My camera died with 11% left. I was thinking that I had plenty of time to go ahead and change out the battery before it died, but apparently I didn't. Anyway, continuing with this reading, it says, alongside the headstrong Emily, Rafe and Jeremy must return to the enchanted world they called home for six months, for only then can they get back everything and everyone they've lost. So you can definitely see the Chronicles of Narnia inspiration in this one. I'm actually really intrigued by this. It sounds like there's maybe going to be a little bit of a mystery aspect to this, maybe some darker themes. Like I said, I actually really enjoyed The Wishing Game. I would totally be willing to read more from Meg Schaefer. And the reviews for this are definitely good. It's got a 4.13 on Goodreads with over a thousand ratings. So this is certainly one that I might be willing to add to my box if it is featured on Book of the Month. All right, and then my next prediction is yet another repeat author. It is Peng Shepard, who was the author of The Cartographers, and that book was also featured on Book of the Month in the past. Her newest release is called All This and More. Meek Play It Safe Marsh has just turned 45 and her life is in shambles. Her career is stagnant, her marriage has imploded, and her teenage daughter grows more distant by the day. Marsh is convinced she's missed her chance at everything, romance, professional fulfillment, and adventure, and is desperate for a do-over. She can't believe her luck when she's selected to be the star of the global sensation All This and More, a show that uses quantum technology to allow contestants the chance to revise their pasts and change their present lives. It's Marsha's only shot to seize her dreams and she's determined to get it right this time. But even as she rises to become a famous lawyer, gets back together with her high school sweetheart, and travels the world, she begins to worry that all this and more's promises might be too good to be true. Because while the technology is amazing, something seems a bit off. Can Marsh really make her life everything she wants it to be? And is it worth it? This says, perfect for fans of Matt Haig's The Midnight Library and Kate Atkinson's Life After Life, best-selling author Peng Shepard's All This and More is an utterly original, startlingly poignant novel that puts the reader in the driver's seat. So that's actually really intriguing. It sounds like this is definitely going to play upon the concept of is the life you think you should have had really better than the life you do have? Because Pang Shepard is a repeat author, I do think there is a chance that all this and more will be featured on Book of the Month. All right, and the very last prediction for this video and this category is a book called My Mother Cursed My Name by Anameli Salgado Reyes. It says, for generations, the Olivares women have sought to control their daughter's destinies, starting with their names. In life, Olvido constantly clashed with her carefree daughter. Then teenage Augustias discovered she was 
was pregnant and left her mother's home in search of her own. Ten years later, Felicitas finally meets her estranged grandmother and is terribly disappointed when Olvido is nothing like a grandmother should be. She is strict, cold, and dead. Now Olvido is convinced the only way her spirit will cross over is if she resolves her unfinished business to make sure Augustus is in a better place regarding family, job, husband, and God, but maybe not in that order. And Felicitas is the only person who can see or hear her. Heartbroken about her mother's passing and desperate to put Olvido's tiny Texas home in her rearview mirror as quickly as possible, Augustus doesn't understand why suddenly everyone in town seems to be conspiring to set her up with every eligible bachelor in town, offer her jobs, and invite her and Felicitas to church every Sunday. As Olvido attempts to puppeteer her granddaughter to fix Augustus' life from beyond the grave, Augustus tries desperately to find a better place for Felicitas, and Felicitas struggles to keep her ability to see the dead a secret from Augustus. All three Oliveris girls are forced to learn how to actually listen to one another, to work to overcome generations worth well-intentioned mistakes, and learn the true definition of home. So that actually sounds kind of fun. It sounds like it's going to be an equal part heartwarming and charming, and also maybe a little bit hard-hitting. You have a young granddaughter who can see her dead grandmother, and her dead grandmother is trying to kind of help engineer things from beyond the grave for her daughter, who seems maybe a little bit lost, a little bit off track. I'm not entirely sure how serious this is meant to be, but I'm intrigued by the premise of it for sure. All right, everybody, that is it. Those are some of the predictions that I have for July's book of the month selections. As per usual, if there are books coming out in July that you think could potentially be featured for book of the month that I didn't mention here, please feel free to leave those down below for other people to learn about as well. Or if you've made it to the end of this video and you are not feeling chatty, go ahead and leave me some type of zodiac sign, maybe your own zodiac sign in honor of the astrology house by Karen Jade. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I typically post two videos a week, one on Wednesdays, one on Sundays, and I would love to see you in any of those future videos or on any of my other social media platforms, which I always leave linked down below along with any books that I might talk about in a video. Until next time, y'all. Bye.